God bless, this is Pastor Stephen J. of Faith Works Church right here in Apopka, Florida, and I want to welcome you to another Faith Works broadcast. I hope and pray that you and your family are blessed. <clears throat> Everyone is in great health. We are back, and we're going to get right into the, the Word of God, as I always do every week. If you are watching me uh, live, please do me a favor and... Uh, Hit that like and that share button, and you know, I get a kick out of every time I watch. And just to be able to see that red dot that says, hey, they are live. So, so if you guys can do me a favor, hit that like and that share, because it's very important that we spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is very important that we give hope it is very important that we be a light in darkness. It is very important that we be that ram in the bush. It is very important that we be that lifeline that, you know, what was that show that you could call and you had three lifelines and like you could uh, ask a question, phone a friend or whatever that show was. It was very popular, but it's not anymore. But for us to be that lifeline to someone else, this is why we preach Christ. This is why we live the lifestyle of Jesus Christ. This is why I ask that you share, not for the likes, not for the, the notoriety or anything like that, but to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, we just got back last night, um, spending a week in Vegas. And honestly, I mean, it's not a place that I would ever say, hey, let's go back to Vegas. It's not a place that I would say, let's go back there. It's not a place that, I'm like, okay, I've seen it, been there, eh, whatever. That's just my, the outskirts, I would say. The natural sense, the mountains and the parks, those are great. Uh, but the actual city park, no. There's just nothing there for me, nothing there at all. And, you know, just simply thinking going there and spending five days there was it five days yeah five days there and just seeing everything one would get the sense that there is no there is no hope one would get the sense of throwing in the towel one would get the sense i quit one would get the sense that why bother one would get that sense. But as I was traveling here, you know, Romans 5 and 20 popped into my head. And it reads, the law was brought to us, the law was brought in so that the tres might, trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. King James Version puts it like this, that says, where sin abounds, where sin is so great, grace much more abounds. So where it seems like there is no hope, where it seems like there's just a waste of my time, the grace of God, the grace of of God, because I, I, what, that scripture right here, 5 and 20, I think about where sin abounds, where it just seems like sin is just so great. And I can imagine from the disciples' standpoint of seeing their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, being beaten, battered, and bruised, and being placed on the cross. I can understand from that standpoint and looking up to say, man, there is no hope. It seems like sin was a, a irresistible force that everybody was running towards sin. But Jesus Christ came as not the irresistible force, but he came as the immovable object that sin could not move. Jesus Christ came as the immovable object that sin had no choice but to bow down to. Because not only was Jesus Christ an immovable object, but in retrospect, he too was an irresistible force. That's to the point that 
when he met people, he impacted their lives and changed their lives in such a profound way that they said, let me follow you. And Jesus was like, no, don't follow me, but go tell of the goodness of God and everything that, 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 that you've encountered. Go tell of the goodness of Jesus Christ. That also was an irresistible force that was unmovable. That's why the word of God tells us even today that when it seems like there is no hope, the Bible lets us know to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding, abounding, there's that word again, abounding in the work of the Lord. Therefore, when it seems like I am so frustrated and I just want to throw in a towel and give up because it seems like I've been preaching my heart out and it doesn't seem like anybody's coming to Christ whatsoever, keep preaching. When it seems like it's impossible, keep singing. When it seems like there's no hope, keep allowing your light to shine. Because honestly, people are watching. I, I, I remember a friend of mine when I worked at Comcast, his name was Warren. I don't even remember Warren's last name. I just remember his name was Warren. And I used to call him Big Warren because he was a big guy. And I remember... I had just recently rededicated my life back to Christ and I was going to church and I started bringing my Bible um, in the work. And, and, and even at the time when I had a cell phone, I had the Bible app or whatever, but sometimes I find the Bible app can be more distracting because there's so much more to do on the phone there is today than it was back then. But back then it seemed like there was a lot of distractions. Okay, okay, what's Facebook? Oh, let me check the internet or whatever. But when you have just the Bible, the book itself, there's no distractions. And I would just sit at my desk and I would read whatever I started to read. And I remember one day, um, Warren came by me walking past my desk and he, he was just like, you're reading that? And I'm like, yeah. And Little did I know, I, I found out later that Warren was watching me read. He told me, he shared that with me, uh, 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 I guess maybe about a year later. He's like, hey, you know, you, when you were reading your Bible, I, I began to watch you. And see how you used to act and see how you came in and was reading your Bible and I saw the, uh, the change in you or whatever. And ironically, we were down here in Florida on vacation and I just could not sleep that night. And I left and I went to McDonald's to get me something to eat. It was probably like two o'clock in the morning. And I went to the McDonald's on 192 to get me something to eat. And there was this gentleman in McDonald's and I was like, man, that looks like Warren right there. And I was so tempted to take a picture because I was like, I'm going to show Warren that he has a brother somewhere down here in Florida. There's a guy that looks like him down in Florida. And, but I never took the picture, but I just couldn't sleep at night. And, uh, when we got back to Delaware, my uh, supervisor had, uh, pulled me over to the side and she was like, hey, uh, how was vacation? I was like, oh, it was great. It's great. And then she was like, I just want to let you know um, Warren passed away. And I was like, what? And then she was like, Warren passed away. I was like, when? She was like, told me the night. And I was like, oh my God, that was the night I couldn't sleep. And that was the night that I saw some guy in McDonald's looks just like Warren. And uh, she told me like his sister had found him or whatever. But when they found him, he was on his knees. So that let me know that Warren was praying. But sometimes as believers someone can turn the fan on or the air on if sometimes as believers I can't let my feelings get in place of the grace of God imagine if Jesus Christ would have given up and thrown in the towels and he had so many opportunities to throw in the towels. I think the heat is coming from the light. That's why sometimes I feel like I'm sweating or whatever. But I, uh, I, I think about when he turned over the tables. I think about 
how he, the Bible says, like he, uh, you, he groaned inside with a bit of frustration. So that shows me sometimes that Jesus Christ is human just like I am. Is that he could get frustrated, but he never allowed his frustration to overwhelm him to the point that he was like, you know what? Forget them. I'm not going to do it. I I I'm going to go another route. Go ahead and hook that up. He never allowed that frustration to overwhelm him to the point that he turns his back on mankind. In fact, when Jesus Christ was in his most grueling position in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. That this isn't about me. This is greater than me. And sometimes like when we feel like throwing in the towel, we want to give up, we want to quit. Well, we just don't, we just want to just lay off on other people. There's that scripture that says that greater is he that's within me than he that's in the world. Yes, I may be frustrated, but God, there's something that you have me out here to do. There's a job for me to do, and God, I'm going to preach. That's why where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. Jesus Christ, where it seemed like there was no hope, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. But I love the way this person puts Romans 5 and 20. It says, for wherever sin exists in abundance and is multiplying and constantly expanding, that is precisely the time and place where grace is poured out in a far greater surpassing quantity. That where it seems like. So yes, there is, there is what I saw in Vegas, like a lot of just sin. A lot of where there's no hope. A lot of just where you can easily just fall entrapped and you can easily fall and just give in and blend in. It's so easy to blend in there. Yet there is hope. Because I saw people standing on the corner preaching Jesus Christ. Yet there's hope because I still saw billboards that talked about that Jesus Christ saves, delivers, and set free. Yet there's people, billboards, drivable billboards that were saying that there is hope and then letting them know that the road that they're on does not have to be. See, here's the thing. Sometimes you can get so overwhelmed with life that life says there is no hope. But I saw boards that let people know that there's still hope. And there's hope beyond the grave and there's hope in Jesus Christ. This is the grace of God, something that I don't deserve. This is the grace of God. That's something that I can't sing my way to God's grace. I can't give this amount of money to get God's, to obtain God's grace. God's grace is his favor that I cannot earn. The only thing I can do to obtain God's grace is believe for it. Romans 10, 9 says it best that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead, you shall be saved. Salvation, Jesus Christ made it so simple that you can come. There's no application that you have to fill out. There's no test that you have to fill out. There's no quiz that you have to uh, rem memorize. There's this, I, I remember Bishop Price told me years ago that when he became an elder, he had to take a test. And I remember him and First Lady Price telling me that, like, we had to go and take tests. And I was like, well, well what if you fail? Well, and they was like, well, we just had to take tests test another time to become an elder. And I was like, what? I was like, but if God called you, I don't understand the test. I get maybe the paperwork, maybe they want to make sure that you're well-versed in knowledge. I was like, but if God called you, but that was just the thing they did back in that day. But my point is, Christ made it so simple to come to him at any time. And he made it to the point that, man, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, man, he says, I will be found on you. I will be found by you when you seek me with your whole heart. When you're ready to say, I give up and I quit Jesus Christ, I'm here. Guess what? He will be there. How do I know I'm a living witness? It was a Friday night. 
in Newcastle, Delaware. At the Newcastle County Airport, I was working in a hangar, cleaning the hangar floors with this big old machine. My mother was there. She was cleaning the offices and I cleaned the hangar. It seemed like my life was in a wreck. It seemed nothing was working right. And my mother was like, you need to be saved. And I'm like, as many times as she said that to me, I needed to be saved. For, for some reason, that particular day I listened. A lot of times it just went in one ear and came out of the other. But that particular Friday night, it stuck with me. And I was like, yeah, I need Jesus. I just need Jesus. Because when you just feel like you're at your wits end and just like, and see, let me say this, let me say this, let me say this because it just popped into my head. Because some of you have not come to Christ because of the Christian that you met. Because of the Christian that offended you. Don't allow the Christian that offended you to be in Christ's stead. Read about Jesus Christ. Learn about Jesus Christ. And I guarantee you, read about Jesus Christ and learn about Jesus Christ. You'll see the real Jesus Christ past how the Christian acts. So you cannot judge Jesus Christ on the Christian that you meet. Judge Jesus Christ on the Jesus Christ that you read about. Judge Jesus Christ on the Jesus Christ that you open up your heart and he comes in. When you meet and come in contact with that Jesus Christ, I guarantee you that your life will never, ever be the same. This is the Jesus Christ that I came in contact with because I, too, was offended by Christians. I, too, was frustrated by Christians. I, too, was like, man, I'm done with y'all. Y'all supposed to be Christians, whatever, and y'all just throw me away like that or whatever. I was done. But I ran into a Jesus Christ of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that I read about. And a lot of times the Jesus Christ that I read about in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and even the first beginning part of Acts. Jesus Christ didn't act like the Christians act. And I'm going to follow that Jesus Christ. So when the Christian offends me, man, I'm still looking at Jesus Christ. My eyes is on him. So I said all that. Then I got back into my car after talking to my mother. And I pulled my car on the side of the road next to the grass, which is next to the runway at the airport. And the... The moon was out and it was just as bright as I don't know what. And I got out of the car and I sat on my hood and I said, Lord, I know I need you, but I don't know where to go. And if you would send somebody to invite me to church, I'll go. That's all I said. That is all I said. And the very next day, a brother by the name of Wyatt Whittle walks across the street and invites me to church. The very thing that I asked for. And when he walked away, I looked up into heaven and I was like, wow, that was quick. The grace of God. Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. Grace much more abounds. Where it feels like it's hopeless, hope much more abounds. Where you feel like there's helpless, God, Jesus Christ is right there saying, man, I got you. When you're sinking like Peter was, Jesus Christ is there with his arms stretched saying, grab it. When you find yourself in a boat and you're tossed, tossed to and fro from the storm, Realize that Jesus Christ is in the boat with you and he's teaching you to speak to your storms and speak peace and tell it to be still. Grace much more abounds. Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. They lowered Jesus Christ off the cross and they put him in a tomb. And the disciples were at their wit's end. What are we going to do? We thought maybe he was the one. And then two disciples on the walk to Emmaus ran into Jesus and did not recognize who it was. And they had a conversation with him. And they were so impressed with the conversation of Jesus that they invited him to come and sit down at the table and eat. And then the Bible says, and he's prayed and he break the bread. 
And the Bible says that the eyes of the disciples, two disciples were open and they recognized that it was Jesus. And right then and there, he disappeared right before their eyes. And they jumped up and they ran back to the disciples. It was like, we saw Jesus. We was on the road to, to Emmaus. The way he talked, the way he walked, and the way he broke the bread. That's how we knew it was him. When it seems like no herb grace, much more bounds. And then the disciples, they were in, in there. Then Jesus just appears out of nowhere. And they saw Thomas told Thomas, like, Thomas, we saw Jesus. He came right here. We was all locked in his room, and he came here. And Thomas says, I ain't going to believe it unless I see the nails, the nail prints in his hand and the spear in his side. I'm not going to believe it. And then while Thomas was again with the disciples, Jesus appeared, and he was like, Thomas, here's your proof right here. See the nails? See where they put the spear? And Thomas says, my Lord and my God, I believe. And Jesus simply said to Thomas, he says, Blessed are they who believe, having never seen. I mean, there's greatness, there's power in seeing and believing. Because there's a saying that seeing is believing, and there's nothing wrong with that. But how much greater is to simply believe, having never seen? I've never seen Jesus Christ, but when I read about him, I believe it. And I hold fast onto that belief of what I read. That there is still hope. And you, whoever was watching me now, may feel like there's no hope. I come to let you know that there is hope, and that hope is in Jesus Christ. You already heard me say it. Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead, you shall be saved. Salvation is just that simple. Well, why don't you give him a try today? What else do you have to lose? You've tried this and you've tried that. You've tried man, you've tried this and you've tried that. How about try Jesus Christ? I'm not talking about the Jesus Christ that you see on TV. I'm not talking about the Jesus Christ of the televangelist. Tele I'm not talking about the Jesus Christ of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read that Jesus Christ. Trust that Jesus Christ. Get to know that Jesus Christ and watch him overwhelm you to the point, wow, I like this Jesus. I want to get to know this Jesus. If that is you today, repeat after me simply, Lord Jesus, forgive me of all of my sins. I acknowledge that you died for me, and I acknowledge that you rose for me, and I acknowledge that you're coming back again. Come into my heart and save me, and I shall be saved. Heal me, and I shall be healed, because I believe I believe that you're greater than what my circumstances tells me. If you said that with me, said that prayer with me, welcome to the kingdom of God. Welcome to hope. Welcome to joy. Welcome to peace. Welcome to Jesus Christ. Beloved, this is Pastor Stephen J. at Faith Work Church right here in Apopka, Florida. If this message is a blessing to you, send me a message, put a comment, Hit a like, message me, DM me, whatever. Let me know this has been a blessing to you. If you would like to be a financial blessing, please, you can cash at me at dollar sign faithworks1109. Dollar sign faithworks1109. Or you can simply download the Givelify app to be a blessing. Beloved, this is Pastor Stephen J. Let's continue to pray for this nation. Let's continue to pray for the leadership. Let's continue to pray for the people in Ukraine. Let's continue to pray for the people in Israel. Continue to pray for the people in Palestine. Again, let me say this. Why do I say pray for the people in Palestine? Because everybody that's in Palestine doesn't support Hamas. That's why I say pray for the people in Palestine. Just like everybody in this country don't support uh, Donald Trump and don't support uh, Joe Biden. But we pray for them regardless of their political affiliations. Because there's nobody above Jesus Christ, not Donald Trump, not Joe Biden, not the Democrats, not the Republican. Jesus is not a politician. He has no political affiliation whatsoever. But we pray for each other because that's what the Bible commands us to do as believers to pray for one another. To pray for one another. Well, if they just know, if you just pray. If you just pray. 
There's a lot that people can do, but if you just pray. Why do I say that? Because the Bible tells us to pray. It says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. What do you mean humble themselves and pray? Take the Democrat coat off, take the Republican coat off, take the political coat off. Well, they got into that to themselves. No, take that coat off, the judgmental coat. Humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Then when I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I will heal the land. There's power in prayer. That's why we pray for the people. That's why we pray for our enemies. That's why we pray and continue to pray and believe because God is able to do above what I think and above what I ask according to the power that worketh in us. God bless. This is Pastor Stephen Jay, and I will see you next week.